This has to do, of course, with the Idaho murder is another story that we've covered extensively as well. Want to bring you an update on that today as Brian Koberger, the man who's charged with killing four university students at Idaho in a gruesome attack nearly one year ago now. It's hard to believe it's already been that long since this tragedy occurred. Well, he was back in court today for a pair of hearings. His defense team attempted to convince an Idaho judge to throw out the indictment against him, alleging grand jury bias, inadmissible and insufficient evidence, and prosecutorial misconduct. They also talked about the idea of having cameras in the courtroom. There's been a lot of back and forth on that as well. And for the very latest to kind of help us get a better understanding here, we want to bring in attorney Nicole DeBoard, who often joins us when we talk about the Idaho murders case. Nicole, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Sure, thanks for having me. So let's first just begin with the defense for Koberger looking to dismiss this indictment. The judge denied that motion, but kind of walk us through what they were thinking. Is this a pretty routine move in a major case like this? It's really not so routine, but, but it is good work on the part of the defense team. It is extremely thorough. This defense team went all the way back to the grand jury phase of this indictment and challenged the idea that the grand jurors did not receive the proper instructions about the burden of proof that they would have to consider in issuing the indictment and asked that the court overturn the indictment and essentially send it back for preliminary uh, review. And the judge felt that the state of the law as it exists now uh, did not allow him to do that and denied their motion. So when it comes to a defense team trying to present a case in that way, do you think oftentimes it's it's more often that the judge uh, denies a motion like that? Or sometimes do you, do you see that happen where the judge agrees with the defense? Sometimes the judge will agree with the defense. And the reality is, is that a good legal team, a lawyer is supposed to take a very close look at all of the law as it applies to the case. And these lawyers are doing just that. And even though the judge may deny certain motions, uh, the lawyers still want to make these types of challenges. It's not a question of whether or not they're going to win the challenges. It's a question of whether or not they're going to actually make them and put those challenges into the court record. Because if the prosecution is successful in this case, one thing you can be guaranteed of is that there will be an appeal. And so the only things that can be considered in an appeal are things that are brought up into the court's record. And so that is why the lawyers did this and do what they do. They want to put challenges forth for the judge, uh, force the judge to rule. And even if the judge doesn't rule for them, a court of appeals can later take the issue up and consider it themselves. And it's interesting, too, because today the, the two hearings, the first one, no media was allowed inside of that one. So we really didn't know what had happened there. And there's also this gag order that we talked about previously as well, things that people are speculating about, obviously information that really hasn't been made public yet. So when it comes to some of this information, such as this hearing that happened earlier today, such as the gag order, when do you think that the public might be able to get a better understanding of some of those details. I think that the court is very methodically uh, moving through each of these motions. And it does appear that right now uh, the judge is going to, for example, let cameras into the courtroom, uh, but keep control over what is happening with those cameras and set forth certain guidelines as to what can happen with the use of cameras in the courtroom, for example. Sure, and I want to talk about that next, actually, because today we did learn that cameras will be allowed in the courtroom, but the judge will be very in control over the use of them. So how do you interpret that? What does that mean? I think that the judge is concerned about the points that have been raised by the defense uh, about the use of cameras in the courtroom and, quite frankly, the points that have been raised by the prosecution. This is an interesting case in that even though the defense and the prosecution agree that cameras should not be in the courtroom, the victims' families want cameras to be in the courtroom, which is an interesting consideration. And by and large, courtrooms are supposed to be public. Proceedings are supposed to be public. The public is supposed to know what's happening in our courtrooms across the country. And the judge has to very seriously consider the public's right to know. But the judge also has to carefully make sure that no constitutional right of the defendant is being uh, 
limited because of the way cameras are being used or because of the way the case is being reported throughout. In other words, all of what happens in that courtroom should be based on evidence and decisions which are made in the courtroom and not based on things that happen outside the courtroom. One concern you may recall is that the defense raised is that, as you can see here, cameras are picking up what is going on on that defense lawyer's computer. Um, we you know, have to take certain uh, precautions when we're in the courtroom to make sure that a defendant can communicate with his lawyer effectively and that what the lawyer is working on can be done so with the you know, confidentiality so that the lawyer can communicate with a uh, client and, and make sure that he's communicating with her in a way that is not uh, broadcast to anyone, including the other side. Sure. And, and Nicole, obviously there's been so much, as I mentioned, right when we got into this interview, it's hard to believe that it's already been nearly a year since this horrific incident happened near the University of Idaho campus. And we've heard a lot of evidence since then against Koberger, the phone records, his white Elantra, his DNA on the knife sheath under one of the victims, most notably. It really seems like there's a strong case here. So I guess when you look at what comes next, uh, both what comes next and also what you think could be most compelling in terms of the evidence for the prosecution and also what the defense's best argument might be, kind of a couple different angles here that we're throwing at you. Sure. I mean, I think that the most compelling evidence is going to be having witnesses tie all of these pieces of information together for us. Um, some of them seem pretty obvious on the surface, right? The cell phone records, the, the vehicle information, um, just the fact that we know he was in the area, or at least we believe we know that. Uh, but hearing witnesses come and testify or, you know, about blood evidence, about uh, the various forensic evidence, which was uh, taken from multiple scenes, all of this will paint a picture that I think, as you've already pointed out, is going to be extraordinarily difficult for the defense. But I suspect what we'll hear from the defense is that maybe there were pieces of this investigation used ineffectively or worse, wrongly. And at the end of the day, um, that's what the defense is going to be trying to do is chip away at the things we think we know or that the state thinks that they can prove. All right. Again, Koberger facing four charges of first degree murder and a felon felony burglary count as well. And if he is convicted, the maximum penalty could be death, possibly by firing squad. So it'll be interesting how a lot of this kind of goes along from here. But as always, Nicole, we thank you so much for joining us today. A lot of uh, big developments in this case as well. Thanks for having me.